Welcome to Go Solo Live. Don't you mean Go Solo Live? Have you ever been asked, why on earth would you travel alone? Go Solo Live not only answers that question, but celebrates life as a midlife solo traveler. This is a safe place for women to come together to reminisce about their travels, encourage others to travel, and to dig into the real lessons learned from these journeys. Now join Jennifer Buchholz with Transform Via Travel as she and her guests share stories of the solo travelers of midlife women. Hello, sisters, and welcome to Go Solo Live. It's Jennifer Buchholz with Transform Via Travel, and it's time to sit back, grab a cup of coffee, and enjoy my conversation with Angie Conker as she shares about how she went from zero to travel blogger in a very short period of time. Angie, where in the world are you right now? Hey, Jennifer, I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm actually doing a road trip of the Florida Keys, so I'm in a uh, one of the Keys called Isla Morada. And it's the sport fishing capital of the world. And I'm just spending a couple days here. I'm going to go fishing for sure. And I'm going to do a whole lot of other things while I'm here too. What makes you decide to do a road trip to the to the Keys? Um, well, I just did a road trip a few weeks ago. I went to, I was up in Virginia. Uh, my grandson had to have surgery. So I was up there for a few days and I decided to road trip back. So I went to Louisville, uh, Nashville, Memphis, New Orleans, and then I came back through um, Foley, Alabama, to see my mother, and I was back home in Tampa, and I started thinking, well, what am I going to do next week? Because uh, like I tell my husband, I'm doing a travel blog, so I got to (laughs) travel. And anyway, I just decided to hit the keys. That sounds wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about your starting off on your solo travels. How did you decide to get started in this? Um, Well, For my travel blog, um, I retired last October, uh, but last year, well, I'm going to say a few years before last year, we're starting to get really stressful at work, and I had been wanting to make a change at work, but I had been with my team for over 15 years, so it was a difficult move to just leave them, you know, and, and I didn't want, every single time I thought, well, this is a good time, then we'd get another new case or somebody would transition in or out. And it just felt like, I just sort of felt like the little mother hen. So I didn't want to leave, leave my little chicklets there. And then um, last year I had to have my hip replaced. Um, my father died. Like uh, I was supposed to go back to work on June the 27th. I went back to work and my dad died on June the 28th. So I had to, go back to Alabama and take care of all of his stuff. And when that was over, I just thought, you know, I've got to make a change. And then in August, my firm offered an early departure package for anybody that had been there over 15 years. So if how long you'd been there plus your age equals 67, they'd pay you to get lost. (laughs) So so I decided, okay, I'm going to do it. But I was only, I'm only, well, I just turned 53 a couple days ago. Um, So I couldn't, completely quit doing everything. Uh, so I thought, okay, I'm going to start a travel blog. I'm going to do something that I love. I had been thinking and thinking, what could I do? What could I do? Um, and then it just came to me one day. I'm just going to start a travel blog. I'm going to travel around. I'm going to write about it. I'm going to give myself like a year to see what happens. And if the travel blog isn't successful, then I'm still going to have had one hell of a year. Either way it goes, it's going to be a good year. <laughs> well, so, that's a lot. So let's take that. Let's take that back and dissect it just a little bit. So first step was hip replacement. Exactly. So um, some major yeah, physical so, stuff. Well, it was physical, but I'm going to tell you that you know I've thought so much about it because uh, so I was living in Virginia where it's cold, and my hip, my doctors didn't want to replace my hip until I was 55. So I was dealing with quite a bit of pain, and I thought that once the last winter. I just couldn't stay in Virginia, and I was going to leave my job. And my boss said, "Um, no, why don't you just work out of our Miami office? So uh, they let me work out of Miami for the year while I had my hip replacement, which was super great. I mean, you know, it was really good of them to do that. Um, But it was funny that even though I've always been an avid traveler, for some reason, and I'm going to say some reason, but I think if I am serious and do some soul searching, it was probably after 9-11, I started getting afraid of flying. Okay. So even though, I mean, I had a, 
this routine that I would do. I never let it stop me. But when I say I was afraid of flying, I mean, I have met a lot of strangers by grabbing their hands when the plane started shaking, okay? You're not alone um, but, in that. I mean, and I appreciate yeah. that we're, I appreciate that you're bringing that up because there's a lot of people who have used to fly and now for whatever reason, they don't fly anymore. So this is legit stuff. Right. I mean, it was interesting too, because it felt like it just came on me on, at one flight, for instance. And I don't even think it was a particularly turbulent flight or anything like that. It was just all of a sudden I got nervous, you know, about what was going to happen, you know? Um, but that said, when my hips started giving me a whole lot of pain, I just thought, oh my goodness, I'm going to go everywhere I can and I'm not going to be afraid anymore, you know, because I realized what happens when you don't have that mobility. Um, Good point. So I had a bad hip and a lot of pain, but it cured my, <laughs> my fear of flying. I mean, because I just decided, you know, just get over yourself because, you know, you want to go or you don't. So anyway, so that happened and that was good. <laughs> so again, it's one of those things of we can either let adversity get us down or we can use it to inspire and ignite. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that was the beginning of that. And then um, my, I had the hip replacement, which was um, major surgery, uh, you know, and I wasn't really ready. The recovery was, was a little bit slower than I wanted, but I wasn't in pain. Okay. And that was the best thing. Um, and then I was, so I had my surgery on March 22nd. I was set to go back to work three months later on June. My doctor extended it a couple of weeks, um, but on June the 27th. And then on June the 19th, which was Father's Day, I got the call that my dad had gone in the hospital. So I went to Alabama. I spent the first half of the week there, you know, and I wanted to stay. I was, you know, and I just kept saying, well, it's better to extend this day that I've already had out of work than to go back to work for one day. But actually what happened was I went back to work for one day and then that night I got the call to go back and then he right. passed away the next morning while I was on my way there. <sighs> okay. So you had just started to, you know, figure out that things were going to be different with, you know, your hip is no longer going to be getting in your way and now you lose your dad. Right. Now, I will add one other thing about going to Miami. Was I have five children, and uh, they're all grown, but I have two sets that lived in the house with me. So when we went to Miami, my husband and I, it was like we were teenagers again, right? <laughs> so I, had, I was going through that life transition as well because of trying to deal with not really being involved in the kids' lives every single day, you know? So yeah. it was a big year for me. It it's was a, a big, big adjustment <laughs> to move into that, you know, move the shift of being the not so involved mom um, in that empty nesting place. And right. this is the place that I talk to people about all the time when they're at that turning point where they're like, things are different for all these different reasons. They're different in this physical thing, even though this is now an improvement. They're different with right. my family in terms of losing your dad. They're different with my kids. I'm no longer, I no longer needed to be a daily active participant in their lives. So what next for me? Right, exactly. And it, it can be tricky, you know, because like when, when I, I knew I was going to take the retirement package. I mean, um, when the girl from HR called me, I said, I guess you're seeing the smoke from my shoes because I'm running out of here so fast. That's so, awesome. I knew I was going to take the retirement package, but then I, almost as soon as I knew that, my mind went directly to, well, what am I going to do with myself? You know, because I, I worked in a law firm and I was a litigation paralegal. So I think the last three years, I don't know that I worked a week under 80 hours, you know, so it wasn't like it was just, um, you know, I was busy and I loved it. You know, it was a challenge. Um, so then it was like, what am I going to do with myself? So that's Absolutely. how I start, got started doing the travel blog. That's awesome. So, I mean, of all the things that you could have chosen to do with yourself at, you, and this was, what year was this? Oh, I, I mean, I just started it in January. Okay. So you were 52 <laughs> yeah. at the time. You just turned 53. Right. Happy birthday, by the way. Thank you, ma'am. And so you're at this point and 
but yet you have a husband. So what does your husband do and, and how does he fit into this whole picture? Okay. Well, he, he, well, I'm not, he works for telecommunications company. Okay. And he was uh, doing sales in North America. His role just changed today. <laughs> so, but he traveled a lot, um, a whole lot for work. So it was, it was the norm for us for him to be gone three or four days a week. Um, you know, and, and we've always, I'm going to say joke with air quotes because it, between us, we know that it's not really a joke, but that his traveling is what kept our marriage so strong because we weren't on top of each other all the time. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I know it wouldn't work for some folks, but for us, there's something to be said for distance. You know, they talk about absence right. making the heart go front, grow fonder. I do not judge about that in any way, shape, or form. And my boyfriend of two years lives overseas, so I can relate. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I mean, it makes the times that you are together, they're a little more quality because you, you know not to waste it. Absolutely. Um, so, you know. So it, he it doesn't been... work for everyone, but there is... You know, finding what works for people is just, let's go figure it out. So what did your husband say? It, exactly. Uh, so I'm just going to say one more thing about that. Mm -hmm. so that's what I always told my, uh, my kids, too. It's like, there's no normal. I mean, what's normal is what works for you. You know, that's, that's what has to be normal. Exactly. So don't get caught up in that. Um, so uh, he travels all the time, and he was just really happy that I – decided to do something based on something that I love. Uh, he's been extremely supportive, which, you know, that this kind of thing could go either way because I've been traveling and not just traveling, but I've been going some pretty, pretty cool places. Um, and he hasn't come along with me. Um, so he could really be a big thorn in it, but he hasn't. He's been fantastic. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So not to, he, so supportive in in many levels, which is really oh right, exactly. I mean, yes, <laughs> that's great. So how did you get started? What, I mean, you you decided you're going to do this. You decided it's going to be about travel. Where'd you go first, and why? Okay. Um, well, so when I left my firm, uh, my team gave me this going away party and they gave me a really great um, gift certificate to our travel company uh, that worked, you know, that from, that the firm uses. So having been the person that got all those get togethers for years that I organized them and collected when I got this great certificate, okay, I knew that that was like, I mean, it's like getting blood from a turnip, right? <laughs> so I was like, oh, my gosh, I, ha I can't believe, first of all, that the person that organized it was able to get that much donated for me. That's and awesome. then I thought, you know, I'm going to do something fantastic with this. Um, so I ha just had it in the back of my mind. I'm going to do something great. And I had been thinking the last few years that maybe I might go to Vietnam. I, I, and then after my dad died, he was a Vietnam vet. And. I know one of the last things he told me was that going to the war changed him. So I thought, okay, I think I want to go to Asia. So Ooh. I was looking online and I saw, sorry. That's big. <laughs> sorry. Um, oh, that's great. I saw um, a cruise that left from Singapore. So I thought, Whew, okay, that's what I'm going to do because uh, I was able to get the cruise with the certificate they gave me. And then I found the air airfare for $600 from Florida. My husband gave me two of his, he's a, he flies all the time. So he's a 1K member. Oh, he gave yeah. me two of his upgrade certificates. So I got to fly Polaris business class mm. on that 17 hour flight from San Francisco. Okay. That is um, awesome. So I, was like, I was like, oh my goodness, I'm starting off with a bang here, you know? Um, so that's what I did. I went, that's why I went to Asia and I went to Singapore. Then I got on the cruise, went to Vietnam, went to Thailand and came back. And right before I left, I mean, literally a few days before I left, my daughter, who has three kids and they were trying to 
think, planning to have their fourth. She wanted to take a trip before she got pregnant. So she said, Mom, I think I want to go to Alaska. And I said, in February? <laughs> you know, it's freezing by cold in Alaska. Um, but anyway, she said yes. And she said, do you want to join me? And she was leaving the very day that I landed back in San Francisco from Thailand. So I thought, well, I don't really want to go to Alaska because I don't normally like cold weather. But I didn't want her to go by herself, even though she's 26. <laughs> you know, I can perfectly go by herself. So anyway, so I met her there, and we we spent a week in Alaska, and we did a road trip from Anchorage to Fairbanks, and we saw the Northern Lights. So that's what got my whole travel blog started. <laughs> wow, was call that a whirlwind? Uh, yes. So yes, have you ever been was. to Have you ever been to Asia? No, no, Tell and us a little I little bit about that culture honest, shock. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's two things. The first thing is. I didn't look at the flight before I booked it, and I had no idea that I was going to be on a plane for 17 hours. That was probably um, and that's the best. serious. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, but that's a serious flight. Um, so when I got to Singapore, I mean, I guess just like everybody, you know, it's beautiful. It's beautiful in Singapore. Everybody's so friendly. Everything's clean. You feel very, very safe in Singapore. Um, when I got on the cruise ship, also great, you know, I'm I'm a big talker, and I made friends, like, in the first 10 minutes that I hung out with for the whole cruise, nice. uh, which is great, and still friends trying to plan up some road trips with a couple of them now, come over to the States and go with me, um, but uh, when we got to Vietnam, that was a very big culture shock, um, you know, I haven't even blogged about it yet, because um, I don't want to say I was disappointed, because I'm not really sure what I expected to see, but it's a very big culture shock. You know, it's it's so it's so right in your face that it's a have and have not country. Okay. Um, that that's a little bit. It took me back a little bit. You know, okay. um, and uh, some of the things that they, some of the excursions that they do, and the trips that you take, um, they're done only for tourists, like. Um, in Thailand, when you go to the floating markets, they actually shop on the floating markets. I mean, that's how they've done it for years before people even saw it. In Thailand, I mean, in Vietnam, they do like the Mekong Delta boat rides, but they don't travel that way. They only do it just for tourists. So it's not truly so it's, an authentic experience. Right. It didn't feel very authentic, but I only, I mean, you know, to be fair, um, I was only there two days, you know, and I did stuff off the ship. So I don't, I think to really experience it, you'd have to go and stay there and, um, you know, and immerse yourself in the culture. You know, it's, it's not really fair to judge from, from that day. And then you see families on scooters. So you'll see right. like the mom and dad with helmets and then two kids in between them and no helmets on. And, you know, and for us, you know, I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, what if y'all crash? <laughs> like, you know, um, yeah. Well, so it is something to be said there, though. Like, so you have had a chance to get to that country, which is great. But it's a different, it's a different thing than really experiencing that country. And that's an example of what happens when we do cruises, not good or bad, because I've done a bunch, and I there's a lot of reasons why I like doing cruising as my way of seeing parts of the world, but it is a particular experience. It, you know, that's, yes, that's so true. I mean, the one thing that I love about cruises is that you can hit a bunch of spots that you only have to unpack once, and it's also really nice if you say go, like, the, the best cruises I've had have been with my daughter's. Um, you know, adult daughters. So it's fun. Everybody can do something that appeals to them. Yep. You know, and then you can come together in the evening. Uh, I mean, I'm a big karaoke person. In fact, I will say this. One of one of the cards, I, and I put it on Facebook, I feel so understood because my husband got me a card that said, uh, that karaoke isn't going to sing itself. Get out there and free bird it on your birthday. Okay. <laughs> So I was like, yes. Yeah. So the cruises, it's a whole different experience. And 
and like you said, it's not good or bad because I I always look at cruises. If I'm going to a place I haven't been, well, give me the opportunity to see if I want to come back. I agree. You know, I love um, that attitude. And and I've also done cruises like I remember a cruise that I took. Um, I was extremely stressed out at work. Uh, one of my children, my youngest. Um, was going through some really emotional, an emotional situation that I had been so busy at work and I was just dealing with that on a surface level. I knew that I really needed to deal with it, but I just couldn't at the moment. And um, we had had like three feet of snow and I was sitting at my kitchen table working and we were getting ready to go to trial in Ohio and the case settled. So I texted my husband and said, you know, I'm booking a trip. And within a week, I was on a cruise out of Baltimore going to Bermuda. Okay. Um, but I used that cruise to deal with what was going on with my youngest child, you know, to work through it. Because on a cruise, you can or cannot get off. You can be as private or as personable as you want to be. Um, you know, there's a lot of autonomy on that when you go on your own. So I, I used that cruise to just work through that, get myself out where I needed to be, to be the best support for my child. Can we you know. talk a little bit more about that? And, and the reason is because this is partly how I've got started doing this business and why I believe that there's a lot of people who haven't really, there's travel for the sake of travel and experience and things like that. But I also believe that there's a very healing power of travel. I'm actually working on a paper on that right now for a course I'm taking. And I went with a purpose and intention on one of my solo trips to work through a bunch of the stuff that was coming up for me when I turned 40. And right. when I went with that in mind, specifically working through, you know, how do I bring closure to a relationship? How do I deal with the grief of losing a parent? How do I process whether I'm going to try and go it alone and have kids or not? Like there was a lot of right. messy stuff in my head. And I decided to journal and listen to music and read the books and do the work that I needed to do so that I could emerge from that, not just having experienced a whole different time and place, but be having been in a time and place that I didn't have to worry about anybody else. And right. I could just take care of myself. So can you share, I, I, I certainly am not trying to ask what was going on with your youngest. You know, we don't need to even go there. It was more about how how were you processing and what were some of the things that were helpful for you to be able to do while you were on that cruise? Okay. Well, I'll say the first thing that I think is that as women, we carry so much all the time. I, and it feels like, you know, when you're, you're younger and your kids are small, you keep thinking, well, if I get to this point, then this and this, but we have so many distinct phases but every one of them has so much burden to it in one way or another, um, either to other people or our bodies going through changes that, you know, weigh us down and we, we have to deal with them. Um, and, and then if you try to throw in a professional work environment where, you know, you're also expected to be an employee and have that persona as well, you know, that's a lot that you're carrying around. So I knew that that was what was going on with me um, with what was, happening um, because at the time my husband was working in Chicago because our youngest was in high school. So it wasn't really feasible for me to move to Chicago with him. So we were doing long distance that way. Um, I have a grandson that has special needs and he was having quite a few problems at the time. He's, uh, he has cerebral palsy and he's paralyzed on his right side. I mean, he, he has serious problems and he was going through a rough time. Um, and then my youngest having this problem, I had one at college and then my oldest, her father had passed away. So I've got all this going on and wow. he was my first husband that I married when I was 18. So, um, there was a whole lot of stuff going on. Um, but I was able to get through it because I was able to get through it on the surface because I had, I was getting ready for this trial. And when you're in trial mode and preparation, you basically work 20 hours a day. You know, it's all, you're going 900 miles a minute. And then when it settles, you just 
bang up against the wall. So um, I knew the second that I got the call that we had settled that case, you know, my, my, I looked out at the snow. I mean, I can see it in my mind like it was yesterday. I just looked out at the snow and I said, okay, I've got to go somewhere and deal with everything else that's going on right now. Um, because now I don't have this excuse, right? I mean, I think as women, because we have so many responsibilities, we prioritize them in our minds and our own feelings go either to the back until we can deal with them or we put them off so long that they just push forward and, and we crack, right? Um, so when I booked the cruise for the next week, I thought, you know, I'm just going to get on here and relax and think about everything. I spent about three whole days crying, um, you know, just coming to terms with everything, sitting at the pool. I was reading a book and I was reading one of those Jody Picoult books. <laughs> yes. He gets me every so, time. Of course, when I got to the end, I started crying and I didn't stop for three days. It's, you know, it was everything in that book, and then it was everything I needed to cry about for the last year. <laughs> That's awesome, though. So, okay, a couple places where I love to cry. I love to cry in the car, and I love to cry while traveling. So that's great. And then right. like, having this alternate reason to cry. I'm really crying for the book. Right, <laughs> exactly. Well, that got it started. <laughs> um, you know what? It was really nice because I knew that I had gone on the cruise to work through my stuff. And so it was really nice for me because I just was able to let myself do that. I had some fun. I made some friends, you know, and I heard by my talking, um, I heard a lot of other people's stories. Yes. You know, when I was, when I was open about what was going on with me, um, you know, I made some friends on that cruise that had gone through very similar situations or were anticipating something like that happening um, with their kids. And I don't know, it, w it was really interesting. I mean, I found that in all my travels, though, when you open up, um, you know, it reminds me of that Kleenex commercial in New York where they put the sofa out. Everybody loves to talk. And if you have somebody that you think can listen to you um, and has no reason to judge you or hold it against you, you know, it's so much easier to just say it. Well, you know, actually, that's part of, again, I, when I think about like therapeutic type of travel, I work with women who are going through some transitions that sometimes include um, separating from a loved one and talking about, you know, I'm single or I'm divorced or separated mm -hmm. or whatever. And saying those words out loud can be really challenging. And so to be traveling right. in a place where you get to practice saying that stuff to people who don't have a vested interest in why you're not with somebody or, or right. how are you doing? It's just your new status. It's this really non-threatening way to practice your story. Well, it really is. But I also think as another aside to that, um, when you travel by yourself, um, you can't help but become more confident in yourself um, because you are you know, you're getting yourself through every day. You're experiencing things that you haven't. Um, you're learning how to go through customs and scan your own passport and speak up for yourself and speak to somebody in another language. You know, you, you go over there with no knowledge of their language or anything, but somehow you manage to stay fed and clothed and, you know, get yourself a hotel room and it builds up your confidence, you know, a, li a little bit at a time. And I think it's, that's another reason that it's good therapy for women because there, you, I just don't think you can travel on your own and not become more confident in yourself. I agree. And a lot of people are like, well, my husband's still around, so I'm not going to travel on my own. And then I talk to people on the flip side of that and they say, well, my husband and I always only went to our cabin together and now he's been gone and I haven't decided if I can even go back. And then when they do go back, they have this huge sense of accomplishment, which I respect and appreciate. They're like, it shouldn't be a big deal. I said, this isn't something you've ever done before on your own. And we should celebrate that. You know, training ourselves for these baby steps of independence is important. Exactly. Yes. I, I so much agree with that. I, it's interesting. I think because, um, even from the time my kids were little, I've always taken road trips with them by myself. 
you know, because uh, when they were little, I spent six years home with them. So I couldn't, my husband couldn't always take off work and come with us. Right. Um, so I would travel with them on my own. And then as, you know, as time goes by, you take more trips on your own. But I have a lot of friends that say, you know, you're really brave. Um, but I'm, I wouldn't say I'm particularly brave. I mean, anytime you travel, you experience things that you have to work through. And maybe you're not going to tell everybody, right? Like the time you were going through the revolving door and somebody snatched your passport in Spain, and but you, your Alabama self ran after them hollering, right? And then they threw it on the floor. Okay, you're not going to tell that story until 20 years later. Right. <laughs> you know, um, because you were scared to death. But you know what? You put your passport back in your purse. You never left it in an unzipped pocket again. Um, you know, and you just learn from it and you go on. And I, I think that, um, you know, there's also a lot of value in learning to enjoy your own company. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of, yes. I mean, I think you have to, I don't, it's not a lonely situation. No, you know, unless you want it to be. It or, to be. Exactly. I love that you said right. that. Yeah. Yeah. But what's so. really important too, you know, is we're often so hard on ourselves of we have to do it best, right, fastest, first, and no mistakes. And yet we encourage our children to make mistakes in safe environments so that they can learn. And that's what I right. think Google Travel is all about is, you know, I don't want anybody to put them in harmful just situations, but to try to do things to gain the confidence so that you can go and do the big things that you want to do or for a future that we're uncertain of, you know, it is important and we might not do it perfectly and we should be a little bit more gentle with ourselves and give ourselves some grace for not doing it perfectly and learning. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, think life itself isn't perfect, you know. I uh, I know I told I used to tell my kids when they were in high school, you know, if anybody tells you that their life is perfect, they're either lying or they're blind. You know, because nobody has a perfect life. I I don't care what kind of house they live in. Uh, you know, I don't care what job their parents have. You know, life isn't perfect for any of us. Um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago I was on that trip from I went from Tampa to Virginia and then I went to um, uh, Louisville, Nashville, Memphis, and New Orleans. But when I was coming up from Virginia in South Carolina, I had a flat tire. So I thought, Oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Because I don't know how to fix a flat tire. Sure. Right? But fortunately my car said low tire pressure. So when I pulled up to the air thing, I'm going to say this, thank goodness I was in South Carolina. Okay. Because everybody there is so nice. I pull up to the air thing and these Two young boys were working on a car that it looked like it might have had 50 miles of life left on it, you know. But the second I pull up, uh, they saw me putting the money in, and then one came over, ma'am, let me do that for you. And he just grabs that air thing and fills the tire up. And I said, you know, I, it's flat, so I think I need to get up there. Do you think, you, do you think I can get up there? And he said, you can, but this car is running, so I'm going to follow you up there just to make sure. So he followed me up to the tire shop, which was literally a mile away. And then when I got up there, they fixed that flat and didn't even charge me a penny for it. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. And he said, no, the next time you need a tire, you just go to discount tires. And I said, you know what? The next time I need a tire, I'm going to discount tires. If I have to drive to another state to get it. You bet. <laughs> you know? That's, I mean, that's you know, the power so. though of, you know, Rather than saying, okay, well, now I'm determined and I'm going to go fix this on my own, sometimes being open to the world around us and that the world wants us to be safe and successful and there is help available even when you're not necessarily asking for it, I, I, that's when one of my biggest lessons, I come from being a pretty type A control freak and once I let that yeah. go, gosh, the world provides. Yep, exactly, exactly. And I mean, sometimes it doesn't happen that good, though. Sometimes you have, you know, experiences that you're trying to work through when you're traveling, um, you know, that are just completely out of your control. Say your flight gets delayed. And well, I had one when I um, 
Well, actually, this leads to a perfect travel experience to tell you about. Great. Um, so I went to one of my daughters and I flew to Rome to meet another one of my daughters. We were going to take a cruise out of Rome, but we decided before we did that, we would take the train up to Florence because I love Florence and I wanted to show them the city. Well, when we get to Rome, I had bought off of Craigslist this brand new Vera Bradley suitcase, but brown with these big old purple flowers. And I was, I mean, I showed that suitcase to everybody because I loved it. And I thought when it comes around, I'm going to see it right off the rack. Okay. Well, I didn't see it because it didn't make the flight. So (laughs) we get to Rome. I have no luggage. I'm wearing uh, this one dress that I had been wearing then like all overnight, right? Because I wore it the day and then got on the flight. So um, we take the train. Now, I will say this. When we were going through and climbing up those stairs to get on the train and all that stuff, I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm glad I don't have that suitcase. Right. (laughs) You know, I would have been lugging that thing around. Been there, done that. We get, yep, we get to our hotel because I wanted to show my daughters a more authentic experience that I thought they could afford on their own um, instead of staying like normally where me and my husband would stay. So we get to the hotel and yeah, it's four flights of stairs up with your luggage. So again, I'm thinking, Oh Lord, I'm glad I don't have my luggage. But the, um, the guy at the front desk, his name was Giovanni. And so it was the fourth floor and they only had rooms on that one floor for the hotel. It was kind of an interesting place. Super nice. And this guy was, so cool and he said you know i'm going to call the airport and i'm going to try to get your luggage and um but anyway i get to the room i'm calling delta um i'm just going to say it's the one time it's one of the worst customer service experiences that i've ever had okay with them i mean the the lady was so rude and she said to me um didn't you pack a change of clothes in your carry-on and i said i said to her i said I just want to tell you that I never really say anything mean to people, but that was a really bitchy thing to say. I don't have a change of clothes or else I wouldn't be calling you so desperate right now. You know, I'm in a city where their probably extra large t-shirt wouldn't cover the front half of me. Sure. Right? So it's like you saying you're going to give me a hundred dollars. That doesn't matter. But anyway, while I was there, my suitcase didn't get there. I told you my grandson had special needs. And at the time he was three and a half. My daughter called, and they thought he had had a stroke. Oh, boy. And was going to the hospital. So I immediately, immediately that suitcase went to its place in my mind, which was nowhere. Right. You know, who cares if I get the suitcase or not? Um, And I started checking on return flights. Well, I realized, okay, with the time difference, there's no sense to worry about it right now. I've got to let him get to the hospital, and I've got to be able to talk to customer service at Delta during normal hours. So um, I went down, my daughters went out and had, they went out for pizza and I decided to go walk by the river. So I was walking by the river and I came back the next morning. I still hadn't heard anything, but it was so early. It was like six in the morning. I got up and I walked along the river and there was a big church there right on the end. So um, I'm not a big religious person, but I am spiritual. I mean, I, I do believe in Mm-hmm. living the kind of life that creates the, you just want to be a good person. And I believe in that. And I think that that leads to having a good spiritual presence. Um, so, but I went in the church um, and I sat down like on the third row. And once I got in there, I just completely broke down about my grandson mm-hmm. and about three rows back, there was an Italian woman and she had a picture of um a young boy that probably looked, I'm going to say 10, 10 or 12. She came up and sat by me and we hugged and cried for like 30 minutes. Mm. She didn't speak any English. I didn't speak any Italian. We hugged each other. And when we left, we both lit the candles and we hugged each other at the door and we both stopped crying. But it's one of the best human experiences that I've ever had because I felt like we were comforting each other. Um, Absolutely. You know, and again, it would never have happened if I hadn't been traveling. As it turned out, my grandson was fine. He, it wasn't a stroke. He had just had a seizure. And so they increased his medicine. He was fine. And when I got back to the hotel, uh, about 930, Giovanni had my two games. Wow. So it's like, you know, sometimes you just have to 
you just have to be willing to go with it, you know. And I had already, before I found out about my grandson, I had already decided, okay, when I get on the cruise ship, I know they're going to have some big old T-shirts. I'll just give me some T-shirts and a pair of shorts, right, Mm -hmm. and be good to go. Um, You know, sometimes things when you're traveling don't go the way that you want them to, um, and you just have to just kind of regroup and deal with it, you know. And, again, it makes you stronger. It does. And definitely builds up your confidence. Every one of those experiences, you know, we may not be feeling it in the moments that we're in it because we have to actually process through and deal, but every single one of those experiences adds to our toolkit and we are able to then adjust and adapt going forward about, you know, how much are we going to let some of these things bother us or things like that in the future. Exactly. You know, yes. And that's, that's, I think the one thing that I love the most about traveling, like if you're by an ocean or my daughter and I went to Alaska and um, because we were there in the winter, which nobody goes to Alaska in the winter, we walked to the end of the state park. And when we turned to the right, there was Mount Denali with no, I mean, there was nothing in front of it. I mean, it moved me so much. I started crying because I just couldn't believe it. Um, And then we saw the Northern lights. It just sort of helps you, I think, put in perspective, you know, things we we have a very small role we have a very small role so the best we can do is just try to be so a good as good a person as we can be enjoy it make the most of it you know absolutely well angie you've shared some wonderful nuggets from your experiences with us today i can't believe how quickly the time has passed <laughs> oh my goodness me either <laughs> i would love to make sure that people know where to find you and how to connect with you can you let everybody know Oh, sure. The uh, name of my blog is Bama on the Road. And so you can find me on Facebook, Bama on the Road. My website is BamaOnTheRoad.com. And I'm on Instagram also as Bama on the Road. And I'm trying to learn Twitter. So maybe soon you'll see Twitter. (laughs) Fantastic. Well, you had some wonderful tales to to share with us. And if they're following you on your website, they can see all of the upcoming trips that you've had and you've had a whirlwind so far. I can't believe you've only been at this since January. Very impressive. Oh, thanks. Yes. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the year too. I have a trip planned to Portugal, um, another one to England, and I'm hoping to get to Scotland too by the end of the year. So That's should fantastic. be good. <laughs> Angie, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Jennifer, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wasn't it great to hear the stories that Angie shared with us today? I think what I noticed most was her resilience and her adaptability and now her determination to make this new job a success. I can't wait to follow her and see what she's up to next. Now we're at the end of today's episode and the conversation doesn't have to end there. Go to www.transformviatravel.com to join our email list or follow us on Facebook at Transform Via Travel or on Twitter at Go Solo Live. Don't forget to share this episode with friends, subscribe so you're always getting our latest episodes released each Friday, and if you'd be so kind as to rate and review our show, I'd certainly appreciate it. If you want to be a guest, reach out to me directly at jennifer at transformviatravel.com. And until next time, remember, go solo, not alone.